That's it. Beautiful. It. And I've learned I can do all S S. No, that didn't work. Huh, that's interesting. I can get this. It might take a moment, but somehow for yeah, that that's not working. But this will work. Up here, slideshow, slideshow. So, uh, Deirdre, that's visible? Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. So it's another slide I stole off of the web. And as I said last time, if they want to, if they want a cut of the proceeds, <laughs> they can email me. <laughs> Great picture. It's pretty close to my home. It's about two miles upstream from where I live. Uh, Met Hal. Um, well, thank you everyone for part, for joining for a last round of ecology. The Met Hal. It's really it's a it's a great subject. It's a great subject. It's a little more challenging because uh, you can't show pictures of flowers and animals and just say this is such and such and <clears throat> some information. It's, it's, it's just a little more uh, nebulous ecology, but boy, it's a good subject. And I've enjoyed, I put this program before together before and again now, and I, every time I, it's a reminder to me and I learn again and I think, could I move in that direction? Could I live more ecologically? <clears throat> I wanted to mention there are a couple things you might want information on. So you might want my email. You might want to write it down. You might not, but it's Dana at methownet.com. And what comes up here is one, there's a list of the edible mushrooms of the methow, which I, you know, I would send to you if you send me your email. And then, uh, yeah, two other things I think I have written down here. One is there's a... This you wouldn't need my email for, you could Google it, but it'll come up here. But there is a mushroom identification uh, app called MycoWeb. I think you can Google MycoWeb. And it's probably the best tool I have found for identifying mushrooms. You, you enter in the, the attributes of any particular mushroom that you have, you hit enter, and it shows you a list of possible mushrooms and usually pictures. And it's even better than uh, David Aurora's, a little bit better than David Aurora's Mushrooms Demystified, which is excellent. And that's, a, as far as I'm concerned, the best book I know of on Mushroom ID. So we're not going into mushrooms very much in this program, but I did list them and there are a few slides on mushrooms. And I wanted to mention that. And the other thing that you might want to email me for is tomorrow night, there is a Washington Native Plant Society program on wildflowers in the Medhow. And uh, it's at seven tomorrow evening, it's free. It's just for something enjoyable to do. And if you wanna participate, you don't have to be a member of the Native Plant Society. Send me an email and I'll send you the link. <clears throat> yeah. So I wanted to mention those things. So talking about ecology, 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 I think the straight definition is study of the household. Study of the household, what does that mean? Well, that means study of the homeland. How does, how does, how do, what are the dynamics of the land in which we live? What are they? And that has to do with the things I listed down below, the energy flow. And we've talked a little bit about energy, but where does the energy come from? Life has to have energy. The answer is really always the sun. <laughs> That's where the energy comes from, but it's not quite that simple. You know, we cannot harvest the energy of the sun ourselves. We need intermediaries. Nutrients, cycling, life needs certain elements and um, minerals for, 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 for the construction of uh, organic structures and where do they come from? This is what, what ecology is about. And then ecosystems tend to elaborate over time. They, they typically get more complex over time. And I thought this picture is one example of that in the sense that this was covered with ice 15,000 years ago. Uh, the ice was melting 15,000 years ago. It's probably still, at this spot, it was probably half a mile thick. There was really no life. Maybe there were ice worms. Since then, <clears throat> it has elaborated in the way we've talked about. There's now over a thousand vascular plants in the Methow. 
and all those other organisms that we've talked about, they didn't all appear at once. They had to get, they had to recreate this ecosystem. Diversity and then competition and the last two things listed there, competition and cooperation, they are interesting because you could argue is life, is life, Darwin said it was competitive. And since then, I think there's been an argument, no, it's cooperative. <laughs> and I think the difficult thing for us is it's both. Right? Our bodies are made up of, <clears throat> trying to remember the numbers. I mean, these are the numbers you get online, 40 billion cell, human cells, they're all cooperating. Life initially was single cell. So these 40 billion cells somehow, they all communicate to function together. Uh, 60 billion uh, bacterial cells in and on our bodies, mostly helping, some of them a little dangerous, uh, 300 billion virus particles. These are numbers off the web. I've never counted them myself. It's just a community. Our bodies are communities of cooperation, which can become competitive. You know, life is also dangerous. It's both. It's hard for us to get that. <clears throat> oh, yeah. This is Spotted Frog Orgy, as I wrote. Uh, I, last week, I tried to play <clears throat> a video of uh, a uh, Western toad rave, I called it, also an orgy. Uh, and I have it in the next slide, and I think it'll play, I'm not sure. Uh, I tried to play it last week and it was invisible, Deirdre told me, and I had gone off of the slideshow and over. So now it's embedded in the slideshow and I had to figure out how to change it to a different kind of file, but it plays for me, I think it'll play for you. But I had been, I had learned 20, this is pictures from 20 years ago at Aspen Lake. For those of you who live in the Methow, you know where Aspen Lake is. And I was walking around Aspen Lake 20 years ago and I saw this pile of frogs. I thought someone had killed all these frogs. I got a little closer and they were all alive. So this is not so related to our topic for the day. I just wanted to try to show it last week and it's interesting and lively. It's like, what is going on here? I do not know what's going on. These frogs are all alive. They seem to be piling up over a large frog in the middle, which would have been a female. Now, these frogs have, the, the females in this pile, if there are females, had all laid their eggs. There was a huge mass of communally laid eggs just, just off into the water there. So they, and that's the same thing in the next slide. Last year, we, we got to Boiling Lake in the sawtooth range and there were these uh western toads these are spotted frogs western toads were mating so they were in amplexus the males were holding on to the females and fertilizing the eggs externally as the eggs came out of the female and then they went into this rave thing afterwards and i've looked it up online i've not found any information if anybody has any idea what this is about so let's see if this thing will play this is what we saw this is a pile of uh western toads you can hear them but they had already spawned they already laid their eggs it's it's not really a video it's more like stop uh photography and i can't yeah. hear it. okay that's too bad because uh for me it's playing and i don't know why it doesn't play yeah but you at least you saw that first slide of the uh, spotted frogs and uh it's really going back to uh the animal kingdom and what are those animals up to? <laughs> I do not understand that. I don't know what they're doing. So, apology. Study of the homeland. Well, that's where we live, is the homeland. And I, you know, I've always liked this quote by Einstein. It's part of a somewhat larger quote, but I just pulled this out. Our sense of separateness is a kind of a prison. I think, you know, probably everybody can relate to that. That we are in these, in these bodies and we we have this individual identity but it's not completely comfortable <laughs> to be these individuals we have a sense that there's something larger well some of the largeness is embodied in ecology that really all organisms are interrelated and um interacting and well i would even emphasize interrelated that all organisms evolve from the initiation of life on the planet and there's something profound about that and it could be considered spiritual 
Ecology is very interesting, and I would hope to prove that in the slideshow. That's the middle slide there, middle statement. Intellectually exciting, a sense of wonder. Ecology is uh, the, the arrangement for life on the planet. It defies rationality. And I'll bring up a few, a few examples that it's just not possible to comprehend. I mean, it brings up, well, I would you know, recommend a sense of wonder for the planet that we live on. And ecology reminds us of that. And ecology is a matter of observation, especially even in a scientific sense, we're trying to understand relationships we need to, we need to observe. And it quiets the mind. And the mind is a little bit noisy. I like the quote by Zorba the Greek. He says, you think too much. Clever people and grocers, they weigh everything. <laughs> So some basics of ecology, as far as I can understand it, there's this basic of energy. <clears throat> That's a, energy is the currency of life. Uh, without energy, there is no life. So where does energy come from? Well, energy, almost all of it, 99.9% .9 comes from the sun, but it flows through daily. It's worth noting. It's worth noting that it's colder in the morning than it was when the sun went down. And if the sun did not come back up, it would get colder and colder and colder but the sun <clears throat> happily it comes up every day uh, uh, remarkably and uh, warms the planet so water's a little different water does not reappear every day actually thank goodness for us being as we got one foot of snow followed by two feet of snow if we'd have gotten th another three feet of snow we would have been buried here in the Methow, but that didn't happen. It had stopped snowing and now it has snow for three weeks and we're probably worried in the other direction. The water flows through annually. The snow will melt, it will soak the ground here in the semi-arid area where we live. I don't need to elaborate, you know this is true, but it's interesting to reflect on the fact that water flows through the ecosystem. So an ecosystem will try, a, 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 an ecosystem that is enriching over time, enriching the life, the, the quantity of organic matter will try and retain energy. Maybe not consciously, but it will try and retain energy in the organic structures, first through photosynthesis, pass it through the food chain slowly. Same with water. The richer ecosystems are able to retain water. Our soils here in the Methow, because it's semi-arid, they don't have that much organic matter and they dry out. They dry out within a week of loss of rain. In our gardens, we're trying to increase the amount of organic matter because it retains water. Resources, life has to have certain resources. Life is 90% carbon, shockingly, 90% carbon, but it's also certain percent nitrogen, phosphorus, NPK, potassium, the fertilizers that we use, it has, life has to have these, re, these resources. Do they flow through daily? No. Do they flow through annually? No. They were all delivered when the earth was formed and they are cycled perpetually the, the organic the biosphere does not waste uh resources and you know that's an issue for this juvenile species homo sapiens which where we throw things away and we somehow we're going to have to learn how to not do that so photosynthesis is the foundation for the biosphere because it captures the energy from the sun and retains it in ways that can be utilized by life and there's a balance producers those are the photosynthesizers. Uh, I should have put prey next because the small, small living organisms, animal world eats the producers, the plants, predators prey on the prey. Then it all has to be broken down. So energy, we're gonna talk about energy a little bit. Where does energy come from? It comes from the sun. You know, it's not unremarkable. The sun is 93 million miles away. <laughs> Uh, and it powers the biosphere. It powers, powers the 10 to 20 million species on earth uh, and the gigatons of life. And it's that far away. And it only, I, I think we intercept, I forget accurately, but I think we get one billionth of the sun's energy on earth. And we probably don't want any more than that, but that is where it comes from. So <clears throat> where's the energy in the sun come from? You may or may not know the answer to that question. I, I've asked, I asked that to, uh, when I have the opportunity to go in and harass sixth graders, I ask them, where does the energy of the sun come from? Is it, you know, what's it burning? I mean, why don't we wonder that? 
is it burning firewood or coal? You know, it's a, it's a joke and you probably know, but it's, it's a fusion reactor and it's fusing hydrogen into helium. And this, it's not something I understand very well. I know there's one or two people here who understand it far better than I do, <clears throat> but we can understand the basics that <clears throat> this is, uh, this shows four hydrogen atoms apparently missing neutrons and some hydrogen atoms do not have neutrons and I do not get why that's the case. But they are fused into one helium, they are fused into one helium atom, which has two protons and two neutrons. Well, apparently two of the protons have turned into neutrons. I know they weigh the same, they both weigh one. Dalton, <clears throat> looking at notes here. So, the helium weighs uh, less than 1% less. So this helium atom that was formed from the fusion of four hydrogen atoms that didn't have neutrons possibly, weighs less than 1% less than the four hydrogen atoms. Where did, that, where did that mass go? It got turned into energy. According to, I have no idea how Einstein figured out uh, e energy equals mass times the speed of light. <laughs> squared, 186,000 miles per second. I don't know. But what I found online, I looked it up. It says, so this fusion process of fusing four hydrogen atoms into one helium atom creates enough energy to keep us a 60 watt light bulb shining for a hundred years. This is not something we're going to understand most of us, but we get a sense that there's this phenomenal process going on that is a bit beyond comprehension. And eight how big are hydrogen atoms? Eight million hydrogen atoms would fit on the head of a pin. And one of them, four of them, fused into a helium atom in the sun. This is where the energy comes from. I mean, this is the sense of, you can just, I think you can just be left with a sense of wonder that, that this is what makes planet Earth function. And it's not comprehensible. I showed this before, I'm showing it again. I'm a big fan of photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide. So we're all mortified that carbon dioxide has risen to 413 parts per million in the atmosphere. Life is made out of carbon dioxide. There are two sides to the story. I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. I'm saying we should consider the larger picture. Life is made out of carbon dioxide. It used to be much, the concentration in the atmosphere, plants evolved at about a thousand parts per million. I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying that's the case. If you look at a botany book, that's the case. Life is made out of carbon dioxide. 400 parts per million and has to diffuse at 400 parts per million in through leaves to become the structural basis for <laughs> carbon dioxide. So it produces carbon in the water, it breaks the oxygen off the water. The oxygen is released. In the books, it says it's a waste product. It is not a waste product. It is part of a chemical dynamic. And if that oxygen can get back at that hydrocarbon bond in the glucose, it'll break it apart and release. So I have a little lightning bolt here because there's energy in that hydrocarbon bond. Those are hydrocarbons, that's organic matter, that's coal, that's petroleum, that's natural gas, they're hydrocarbons formed by photosynthesis. If oxygen can get at them, that energy will re be released. And the great secret of life is it's learned to release them very, very slow to power our organic processes. And that's what goes on when we eat food, not just sugar. These things get turned into other things. Oh yeah. So that formula, that, that equation goes in both directions. But there are some issues ecologically speaking, and that is that energy, second law of thermodynamics says energy runs downhill. You can't, in the long term, you can't concentrate energy. You can only uh, make it more diffuse over time. So this is a measure, these J's are jolt, joules, joules. Any measure of energy that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, I looked it up online one time a while ago. It's, a joule is about the amount of energy of a mosquito flying into a wall. <laughs> it's a good picture for us. You know, it's a small measure of energy, but if you get it, a million of them, you've got some energy going there. That's the sunlight coming in, a million joules. The primary producers, the photosynthesizers, plants, algae, and cyanobacteria, which are the photosynthesizers on the planet, they only capture 
approximately of the energy reaching the earth and we only get a billionth of the sun's energy so it's a tenuous arrangement but it does work so when so the plants have have captured the photosynthesizers plants in particular have captured one percent of the sun's energy that reached the earth when that gets passed on to a consumer and there's a picture of a grasshopper supposedly eating that plant it only gets 10 percent. only 10 percent of the energy is usable by the consumer and that's true for the next level. Only 10% gets And there are not very many uh, large carnivores because there's no energy at the top of the food chain. And that's just the way it goes. And the next, I'm going to pull up a little cartoon here. I'm warning you that it's a cartoon. These people are protesting is the second law of thermodynamics. And they are protesting. It's just funny. But there's nothing. It's, it's, this, is, this is why there's why large, rare, animal, large, rare, you might say carnivores are rare. This is why. Energy runs downhill. Carnivores cannot capture the energy of the sun. Photosynthesis can't. This is how systems work. So I think maybe, let's see, do I have my, no, I don't. That I, somewhere in here, I have that picture I showed of the biomass on the planet. 600 billion tons of biomass. By the way, it's thought there probably used to be more and humans have run down a bit, that we're running down the global ecosystem. It's less productive and that's highly possible. Uh, but it's all comes from photosynthesis. It's 90% carbon dioxide. I mean, it's a shocking fact in the same sense that the sun is fusing <clears throat> hydrogen into helium. These are just shocking, shocking, mind altering facts. And so, so what does that mean? The second little line here, it's just the, the biomass on the planet is appearing out of the atmosphere. It's 90% appearing out of the atmosphere. It's not sucking it out of the ground. It's just shocking. It's like a magical mystery tour. So here's Roger Lake. Many of you know Roger Lake. I don't know if you've been there. It's at, it's at Tiffany Mountain, you know, up uh, the Chiwok. For those of you who live here, but it's a little hard to get to because it's wet around the outside of it. <clears throat> Except in September, you can walk in or wear rubber boots. But I have this picture because look at all that biomass. Look at all those spruce trees and lodgepole pines. Where did they come from? The answer is they came from the atmosphere. I mean, this is seriously shocking aspect of reality. So here we saw this a week or two ago, but I like this uh, visual of uh, the six kingdoms of life. And what dominates? Well, it's mostly plants. Those are billions of tons, gigatons. And everything else is kind of a hangnail. Um, the <clears throat> the viruses, you know, we don't. The viruses just, they're big players on the planet, as we have come to understand. So, what happens to all that biomass? Well, if it doesn't decompose, if that biomass doesn't decompose, it gets stored as those hydrocarbons that we've been talking about. Couldn't do it. <laughs> Oh, I didn't think about of coal. I think I saw so that you could see. So what happened here? Well, the 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 mostly plant matter that was produced through the process of photosynthesis oh. over did not decompose. There were not the decomposers that knew how to break down certain complex forms of organic matter created by mostly plants. And I'm speaking lignin and I have here structural diagram. This is lignin. This is wood. This is a structural diagram for wood. Well, interestingly enough, it's just made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. There are no other elements in lignin. There's no nitrogen. There's no phosphorus. There's no gas. There's no sulfur. It started as glucose and plants transformed this into this complex chemical structure that other organic organisms did not know how to break down until one die 
evolve to have to figure out how to break. Probably or not, the planet is probably no longer creating. Somebody needs to check out their mute. Mute it. There's noises flowing in here. Check and see if you're mute. If you're muted. So coal. So fungi did evolve, and I have a brief section here on fungi. Uh, you know, are one of the kingdoms we haven't talked very much about or at all until now. Fungi are decomposers, and they break down the organic structures built by photosynthesis, but they have evolved more, at least equally importantly, into symbiotic organisms. Symbiotic means living together. They live together with plants. So this is a picture of a pine tree that has recently germinated and all the fuzzy outer portion of the roots are symbiotic fungi that are in a, in a mutualistic helpful, positive, beneficial relationship with the plant. They are the, 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 the fungal hairs, the hyphae of these fungi are so fine. They're much finer than plant hairs and they're able to penetrate um, minerals in the soil, organic matter, break it down and make the nutrients available to the plant. It is said now, so We've talked about plants and the number I used previously, there's 300,000 species of vascular plants and then mosses, which are not vascular, mosses and liverworts, but 300,000, it's thought that 90% of them are in symbiotic relationships with fungi and beneficial to both organisms. This is a Boletus edulis, King Bolete. Some of you know it. It's one of the most highly desirable fungi available in the coniferous forests in our area. It does grow in the Medhow, but it's not too common because we have so little moisture here, but it is not, it, I would say it can be common at Rainy Pass, just over the hill from the Medhow and at the Easy Pass in the Easy Pass area, which is 10 miles down the highway, because they get more moisture, they get more rain, but it's, this is the flower, so to speak, of a fungus that lives underground. Uh, the hyphae, the mycelium of the most is underground, and many of them are in symbiotic relationships with plants. So it's ecology, it's a relationship. Everything is in relationship. So this is a list of edible mushrooms in the Met How. If anybody wants it, I'll email it to you. And a few pictures of edible mushrooms. Let's see. Oh, the name is there, but it's blocked out by in my screen. I don't know if it's blocked out on your screen. Oh, that means uh well, they call it one on the left, a snow mushroom. It's, uh, it's gigas, is it? Uh, I forget. Oh, gyrometer gigas, gyrometer gigas. I know it's not important to you, but <laughs> I learned these names and then I forget them. So, you know, it's mildly distressing. It's quite edible and quite, it's common as soon as the snow melts. You all know morels over on the right. There's this lion's mane mushroom which is not very common in the Methow, but it's again, it's common at Rainy Pass and uh, Easy Pass. So that one is at Easy Pass in the lower left, at least on my screen. And that cutoff log is sitting over a tiny little stream of water. And I collected that last year and I went back this year and it goes back again because the mycelium, the hyphae live inside that log. They're decomposing that log. And it came back again and I harvested it again. And then on the lower right is a picture of the online app that you can download for free. If you were to Google matchmaker, Myco match, I think matchmaker would get it. But if you do matchmaker, you'll get dating, <laughs> dating websites. Matchmaker, Myco match, it's, it downloads for free pretty quickly. It's very good and pretty easy to use. And then there's, we have all, this is in the Methow, all these edible, fungi, uh, you know, which are, they can, they're common in wet when we get rain in the summer, which there hasn't been a lot of recently. Oh yeah, so I circled up top there, it says page number in Aurora. Well, Aurora is a guy, Aurora is an author. He wrote the book, Mushrooms Demystified, uh, probably 30 years ago. It remains the best book I know of on mushroom identification. The app is a little better. And I might tell you a brief story. I pulled into the Easy Pass Trail. 
And there was a guy with a camera on a tripod and a basket full of mushrooms in the parking lot. <clears throat> now, if a guy has a basket, that means he's a mycologist. That means he's, he really knows what he's doing. That's what mushroom, mushroom, I don't have one actually, but the big time mushroom people, I use baskets to gather mushrooms. I said to him, do you know something about mushroom identification? And he said a little, and it turned out to be this guy, Aurora. I forget his first name at the moment, but I probably the only person on the planet who ever asked Aurora if he knew how to identify mushrooms. He was supposedly updating that book. This is, could be five years ago. That, that happened but the book a new book has never come out but the old one is really very good another little <clears throat> curious story about mushrooms uh this is uh you could call it psychedelic i prefer the term psychotrophic trophic 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 shape doesn't trophic mean shape mind shape mind shape <clears throat> this is a mushroom that actually is not uncommon in the methow. And it obviously it is the most easily recognized mushroom on the planet. It is an amanita. Some amanitas are deadly poisonous. This one can make you sick. It also is mind altering. Does this look like anybody you know? That would be the question. And the answer is, how about this guy? Oh, that is a amanita that I found last summer. And there's a penny in that picture to show you how big it is. And I did bring it home. How about this guy? You see any resemblance between Santa Claus and this psychotrophic mushroom, Amanita muscaria? So Santa Claus, what does Santa Claus do? Santa Claus brings happiness to people. Santa Claus visits every house in the world on one night and he flies through the air uh, with reindeer pulling him around. Well, this mushroom is used by so-called the shaman in Siberia and to detoxify it, they pass it, they feed it to reindeer. And then they gather, this is a true story. And they gather reindeer urine and they drink the urine. I know that's not very inviting, but for them, it was a meaningful experience. And it's almost for sure that that is where Santa Claus originated because Santa Claus flies through the air pulled by flying reindeer. It's just an interesting connection you know, this thing that we, that, that we uh, eulogize, we celebrate for our children, probably has its origin in a psychotrophic mushroom. <clears throat> this is uh, at Cutthroat Lake, just behind Cutthroat Lake. Walking in there, I was impressed with this pile of organic matter. Is it going to pile up forever? You know, conifers are 300, 350 million years old. They've been... They've been growing that long and dying and falling over. They live between 100 years and you know, 2,000 years. They die, they fall over. <clears throat> Wouldn't they just make a huge pile of garbage? Well, I've asked that of kids, and they try and figure out where nature puts its garbage, but nature doesn't have any garbage. Everything is cycled. That's the nature of ecology. And it, this, I use this picture to claim that mushrooms are sentient, that if you get out early in the morning, you can find them uh, looking around for organic matter to decompose. So this is actually on my property and this tree, this is a cottonwood that had died, cottonwood tree that had died. And those are oyster mushrooms, which are decomposers. And all the mycelium are all inside of that tree, decomposing that, that tree. And I actually, I will confess, I nailed those two puffballs up there just to make it look funny. <clears throat> but mushrooms, Fungi are the great decomposers on the planet. I suppose along with bacteria, but especially fungi. These are oyster mushrooms. They are edible. The uh, puffballs are edible. That tree fell over. I mean, this picture is 10 years old. And that tree has been on the ground for six years because mushrooms decomposed it. Now it's lying on the ground. It stays moist. And it'll decompose even faster, go back, and, and it'll enrich the soil like this. This is not that tree, but this is also at in the cutthroat lake area but where does nature put its garbage well there it goes and this is a talus field this is a field of boulders that rolled off of those granite cliffs above cutthroat lake and now they've been completely covered by organic matter over the last ten thousand years since the ice age partly through the function of fungi decomposing these organic matter 
and return it to the soil. So then the soil becomes full of organic matter. So soil, so this is uh, ideal soil, a little pie chart of ideal soil. I circled the organic matter. If you don't have organic matter, you don't have soil. You have, we well, call it regolith. It's just rock rubble. Regolith is rock rubble. You have to have organic matter in soil or you can't grow anything. Uh, organic matter, uh, it holds the moisture. It holds that 25% water that falls and it release, slowly releases nutrients to the life forms that are trying to grow in that soil and the energy, the energy in the hydrocarbon bonds that were formed by photosynthesis and who lives on that energy. This is a pyramid of life of one square meter of soil, of good organic moist soil, not dry soil. This is uh, 10 trillion bacteria, 10 trillion bacteria. They actually left fungi out of here and I wish they hadn't because it would be, it would create an even bigger base. Protozoa, nematodes, soil is just, just full of life, but it would not be without organic matter. So it's part of this cycle of life. I'm clicking, but nothing's happening, sorry. So we're interested in, you know, the, cycle, the cycles of uh, the construction material for life. We have the organic matter is cycling. The water, we know cycles, but it's interesting to note uh, as shown here that very little of the water is fresh water on land. The, the lakes, the rivers, most of it is in the ocean. A lot of it is in glaciers and underground and less than one, one tenth of 1%, one hundredth of 1% is fresh water. Fortunately for us, it cycles. It cycles partially from evaporating from the oceans, but partially evaporating transpiration from this, this uh, <clears throat> mass accumulation of biomass that we call forests. Much of the world is, of the world's land surface is covered with forests and they all transpire moisture and it goes into the atmosphere. And it's thought that 50% of the rain that falls on forests is from transpired, transpired from the trees. <clears throat> and the interesting thing is here, we have cut down all the trees. So this is a picture I took from a plane, a jet going into Kabul in Afghanistan, I think. <clears throat> and this is what Afghanistan looks like. <clears throat> There are no trees. Uh, so there's a few trees where it still rains over by the Pakistani border. But the story with Afghanistan is that it used to be 50% covered by forests and they've all been removed by humans. And it's ecological ignorance. It's nobody's fault, but we need to grow up ecologically and replant these trees. And so it's arid. It doesn't rain as much in Afghanistan as it used to. They have a drought right now. Why? They cut down all their trees. They didn't know. I mean, some of those were burned in wars, various wars, not just the recent one. It's a history of war. <clears throat> so, I mean, that, that, that illustrates the point that there's room to grow ecologically and there's no reason not to. It's the most exciting thing we can do is become eco ecologically literate, understand ecology. I'm gonna glance, not too bad here for time. <clears throat> So we, let's see, <clears throat> you know, in the original universe, supposedly it was only hydrogen and helium. That's what that shows in that yellow splotch up there, the primordial gas cloud. There were no other elements. That's the scientific thinking. So where did they come from? <clears throat> they were fused. And remember that the sun is a fusion reactor. The sun is fusing hydrogen to helium. It can be done. Hydrogen has uh, one proton. If you were to fuse two of them, or we saw four of them, you get an element with two protons. Well, what about carbon? It has six. I forget. It's the, the, the create, if you could fuse smaller elements together, you would get carbon, right? You would end up with an element that has six uh, protons and six neutrons. That's what's happened. Nitrogen, seven, oxygen, eight, red giant stars. Uh, I think the sun is a red giant star. It's not that big. Our sun, there are much bigger stars 
vastly bigger, a hundred times bigger than the, the sun. We don't want them near us. When they run out of fuel, they collapse and they, and then they explode. The pressure becomes so great that they explode. And in the explosion, they, these hot blue stars create the other elements. The point here really is another magical mystery to our element that we are actually made of stardust. It's, it's a scientific fact that our bodies are made out of elements that were forged in stars. And this is largely, this is the big history story. You know, big history doesn't get to claim it. It's just a name, but it's as far as it's scientifically the best we know about the universe we live in. So let's see, where were we? Uh, where were we? Well, we were cycling energy. Yeah, oh, cycling water. We have wa we have energy cycling. We have water cycling. But what about the 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 elements? What about phosphorus? Plants have to have phosphorus. Plants have to have potassium. Plants have to have sulfur. Plants have to have calcium. They're all running to the sea. They've been running to the sea for four billion years. Well, what is this potentially intelligent biosphere? this Gaia-like form, you know, that means Earth is lifelike. Earth is lifelike. We can say lifelike, and it's not so scary as saying it's alive. What could, the, what could the Earth come up with to cycle these elements, these critical elements for life that have been running to the ocean for 4 billion years? Well, how about plate tectonics? So I put in these arrows, there is magma rising in oceanic rifts down, right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's probably 10,000 miles long, the mid-oceanic rift. Magma pouring out from the mantle, the it's pushing the ocean crust, which then cools and gets heavier and is pushed east and west and comes up against a continent, which is made out of a different kind of rock and it sinks, it subducts, the ocean crust subducts. So, those, those, so that pulls down the nutrients, the elements, the minerals that were washed into the ocean, they're washed into the, back into the mantle and then they reappear as volcanism out of volcanoes. And that is where the ring of fire, the ring of volcanoes all around the Pacific comes from, is from this process of plate tectonics. Ah, yes. This is a map of ocean plates. And the colors show the ages of the ocean plates. And the red is are the youngest ocean plates. And notice that right in the middle there is the mid-oceanic ridge. Well, it's why are they young? Because it's pouring out of there today. That magma is pouring out today. The They're zero years old. The, then they get older and older. And the oldest is the pea green color. That's only 140 million years old. There's no crust older than 200 million years old on the planet. Why? Because the planet constantly recycles everything on a 200 million year time frame. It's stunning. You know, how can this be so functional? So what do we end up with? We end up with uh, ranges of mountains. This is uh, Golden Horn and Tower Mountain, you know, up near Washington Pass that were pushed up by plate tectonics with the minerals of partially minerals from the sea, also, also turned into more high silica rock because silica melts at a lower temperature. So this is granite. But what good does that do plants? They're up in the top of the mountains. We need the earth needs to come up with some method to grind these rocks down and make those nutrients available to, to life. Well, how about an ice age? Or how about 20 ice ages? And that, that is the approximate number. We don't know for sure because each succeeding ice age erases most of the evidence of the previous one. But for the last 2.5 million years, there have been a number of glacial advances that are grinding down these mountains that were formed by plate tectonics and grinding, freeing the nutrients up and sending them back into the biosphere. As I like to say, that's a picture I took of the Met when I first got here 15,000 15, years ago. Look at the Met today. It's rebuilt the ecosystem. This picture, lower right, that was covered with a mile of ice 15,000 years ago. There was no life. And the ecosystem rebuilt itself partly from the nutrients that came from glaciation. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, I forgot. But I pulled up there on the lower left, but the nutrients are still running to the ocean. What can we, we need something more dynamic than a, a ice age to return nutrients to the mountains. Well, let's invent salmon. So 
the numbers on salmon, formerly there were 20 million salmon, you know, approximately varied from year to year, going up the Cumbia River, River, 20 pounds each, that's 40 billion pounds. That's all ocean nutrients. Those fish were fingerlings when they got to the ocean and they grew up into 20 pound organisms on the organic matter of the ocean. They're bringing the nutrients of the ocean back to the mountains. It's a stupendous invention. The numbers that I see now online is 600,000. There's now 600,000 instead of 20 million. So we have um, weakened the power of the global biosphere currently. <clears throat> you know, it's a short-term phenomenon. I think we can continue to grow ecologically more literate. That's our assignment. And I think it's, it's, it enriches our lives to feel that we're part of something larger than ourselves. And this is real, it's not make believe, you know. So all these, so we've talked about some of these carbon cycles. We've talked at least a, mo a little bit about it that, you know, that's the carbon dioxide cycle, the photosynthetic cycle. Uh, when plants decompose, the carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. Uh, uh, water we've talked about, oxygen we've talked about, Phosphorus is actually, you know, kind of dependent on these ice ages to some degree to grind those rocks back down. The, the rock rubble in the Methow is high in phosphorus. I've had my soil tested and it's high in phosphorus. Some of you know the name Tim Flannery. I mentioned him, I think, previously. He's a good author from Australia. He wrote this great book I have over here, uh, The Eternal Frontier, An Ecological History of North America. Highly recommend. He said, if you, if you want me to tell you how, tell you how rich your soil is, Tell me when your last ice age was, because the ice age will grind up the mountains and release the nutrients necessary to life. You know, Australia isn't is the oldest continent. I don't know why. It doesn't have much in the way of mountains. It didn't have much in the way of an ice age. The soil is terrible, and one of the problems with the Great Barrier Reef is they use huge amounts of fertilizer to grow food in Australia, and it runs into the rivers and into the ocean and has created this hyper nutrient rich outflow from the rivers and it's choking the Great Barrier Reef to death. And they know it and they're working on it, but it's because it's such an old continent and it hasn't had an ice age. Tim Flannery's from Australia. So I think, let's see here, we're gonna talk a little about nitrogen. Nitrogen is necessary to plants. We know that we use nitrogen fertilizers. They're often high nitrogen. It's mildly surprising to learn that the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. It's mostly nitrogen. When we breathe, mostly breathing nitrogen, 21% oxygen, a little bit of other stuff. <clears throat> so what's the problem? Plants need nitrogen. The nitrogen is locked up as a uh, nitrogen molecule. Two atoms are fused together. And I actually drew that little, I was trying to figure out how that works. Nitrogen has six, protons. Remember in the first program, we talked about those um, <clears throat> electron orbitals. First orbital holds two. I think nitrogen has seven. I'm sure somebody caught me on that. Carbon has six. <clears throat> the first two, first two electrons go in the first orbital. The second orbital holds eight, but that only leaves five left five for the second orbital, <clears throat> once eight, once three more, they share three electrons. They have a triple, the two nitrogen mm, elements <clears throat> have a triple bond. Nitrogen in the atmosphere is locked up in a triple bond, sharing three electrons. You cannot break it apart. It's not available to life. There would be no life on earth if there were not bacteria that had learned how to break that bond. They're uh, they, and so we have these, they live in the soil, but they live on uh, nodules on especially the pea family. They do exist in other plants. I was surprised to learn that alder has these nitrogen fixing nodules and bacteria living on their roots, but especially the pea family takes that nitrogen out of the atmosphere, breaks apart that triple bond and makes the nitrogen available to life. And that is how nitrogen cycles. When the plant dies, yet nitrogen goes back into the atmosphere. <clears throat> so obviously this all has to have some kind of balance. And remember that, I don't think I pulled it up here. Maybe I did. Yeah, I did. That uh, feeding, that 
trophic pyramid, trophic pyramid that uh, you can't have animals without plants. Plants have to capture the energy of the sun and turn it into organic matter, which can be fed on by herbivores, which are fed on by carnivores, but that energy decreases. <clears throat> this all has to be in balance. And again, because humans don't, so, well, here's the spotted frog. That's actually that, that's actually that egg mass that was there near that spotted frog rave that I showed you, that pile of frogs. I mentioned they had laid all their eggs. This was right there just offshore in Aspen Lake. <clears throat> I'm not seeing this since, I think they're still there, but. Anyhow, so the question would be, in terms of ecological balance, that one mass in front of that frog is 500 eggs. That's from, that's from a male and a female. And then there are multiple masses in that picture. And there were probably 30 egg masses with 5,000 egg masses each. How many of those eggs has to survive to adulthood to replace the adults? And the answer is always two, the male and the female. So there's 4,998 extra frogs. If it weren't for predation, if predation were not a natural part of the biosphere, the world would fill up with spotted frogs. You would open your closed drawer and spotted frogs would pop out. There would be spotted frogs in your shoes. There'd be spotted frogs everywhere. But there's an ecological balance and most of those eggs do not live. On average, two out of 5,000 survive. So there's this famous story of St. Matthew's Island, which is an island off the coast of Alaska where reindeer were introduced during World War II to feed some people there on a radio station. And I circled down here. This is 29, where I circle the 29 up top, it says 20, it doesn't. You know, they introduced between 20 and 30 reindeer for food, a food supply for these men who were, who were manning this radio station. The war ended in 1945. The men went home, the reindeer stayed. But there were no predators. There was no balance. Reindeer eat lichen, among other things. Reindeer ate everything on the island. They ate all the lichens and all the willows. They grew, there was no predators, they grew to 6,000, and then the population crashed. Oh, and it went down, it says 42, there was one male, only one male among those 42, and some biologists who arrived in 1996, 66, saw the dire situation, shot that male, and now there's no reindeer on St. Matthew's Island, but it's a great example of life out of balance life out of balance, no predators. It, uh, in an ecological system, everything is balanced, at least over time. So we can take this a little bit personally. We've seen this at the beginning of the program. Energy flows through daily. The sun comes up, goes across the sky, goes back down, gets cold, comes back up. It has to be captured by organisms that can store it. Photosynth Water flows through annually. Resources cycle perpetually. There's no waste in nature. All these resources, and there are no more resources being delivered. They all were delivered when the earth was formed. Photosynthesis is critical balance. So what can, is there anything that, so characteristics of an ecological culture would live primarily on energy income, energy income. Over the long term, what else is there? Well, there's stored energy. They call it, one book calls it ancient sunlight. There's a book called The Last Days of Ancient Sunlight. That's about fossil fuels. Fossil fuels is a 100 year uh, bonanza, bonanza. Water, water has to be taken care of. Uh, it, it's, it's not limitless. There's very little fresh water on the planet. Most of it is salt water. Uh, nature creates no waste. If you want a long-term society, we would, we would emulate that. Biologic diversity, the balance of nature is critical, and you can't have any too much of any one species. These are just basics of ecology, you know, that we're learning to put it in a positive light. <laughs> we're trying to learn. And this is the only really ecological or uh, environmental slide, as I did last time. I don't want to come down too heavily on this, but this is a graph of fossil fuel consumption over time. And I, I was quite impressed by this and I circled the impressive bit of information. 50% of all the fossil fuels that have ever been consumed have been consumed in the last 30 years. Well, how long can that go on? So that's a big challenge. And, and the human population, you know, the human population curve looks like that fossil fuel consumption curve. It's supported by fossil fuels. We live in, a, our agricultural system is largely run by fossil fuels. There's no reason that we cannot become ecologically 
more literate and transition to uh, uh, an ecological lifestyle that is sustainable over the long term. But it is challenging for us. So I'm just mentioning that. But we do have the um, self-healing, self-renewing capacity of the biosphere in our favor. So this is Krakatoa. It's a volcano off the coast of Indonesia. You've heard of it. It blew up in 1883. It completely blew up. And there was almost nothing left. And then this island appeared in 1927. This is called Anak Krakatoa, the child of Krakatoa. And I don't know that, I don't know when that upper left picture was taken because that's very, still very active volcano. But what's interesting is the way life colonized it in the lower picture. That given a chance, life is self renewing and will, will heal the natural and unnatural damage to, done to the earth in a very short time. Now, that, act, that volcano is still active. I think it blew up again in the last year. But as soon as it calms down, life will recolonize it. And we can see this in the Met Howe. It's a picture I took five, 15,000 years ago of Silver Star. It's just that the Met Howe was, there was almost no life in the Met Howe 15,000 years ago. Everything we see has reappeared in this way. This is a good book, After the Ice Age, The Return of Life. I recommend it. Uh, but he, she, she talks about this uh, Canadian ecologist talks about how how does life move? How's what have we learned about how life can move? And the scientists have studied it and they see the rate of movement of different organisms and it's recolonized. And I this is a picture I took and this is at Lyle Glacier, which is just off of the Maple Pass Loop. So the Lyle Glacier is just about gone. There is a little bit of ice up there. And there is a stream with glacial flour in it, ground up rocks, because that glacier still moves. The glacier is mostly gone. What happened when that glacier melted? Flowers bloomed. Flowers bloomed. Um, life reappears as soon as it's possible for life to reappear. I'm just saying this as a hopeful, positive aspect that as we learn to live more ecologically, life will bloom. This is dwarf fireweed. It's near Washington Pass. Well, it's actually on the, just off the Maple Pass Loop. So, uh, you know, we live in this land where the flowers are almost as big as the humans. This is my grandson, Xander. <laughs> uh, but we live in land that still has ecological integrity. And, you know, I think we're doing our best to protect that. So an ecological state of mind. I think this is just a direction we want to move. This is out of the Met Howe Naturalist. I can send you this. I have a couple of, you know, pages I put together. It's hard for me to remember. You know, the mind is, is such a mischievous uh, little creature that it just is constantly creating this imaginary world. But we could be observing the natural world and learning about it and increasing the power of our ecological eyes and creating an increasingly sustainable society. The end, don't worry, be happy. Saper ade, that means think for yourself. <laughs> That's it.